So, uh, yeah, it's going to be a little bit different than most of the things that I've done here because we're really going to put a core focus on rigging and um, obviously specifically talking about some of Red Rock Micro Solutions. And as David said, I've had a long history with them. Um, I was a pretty early adopter when people were using video cameras and putting 35 millimeter lens adapters in front of them to get a film look. And then of course when the 5D Mark II came out and cameras like that, we started to get that look in a much smaller form factor. Um, but Red Rock has also made rigs and has made support gear for a long time to work with initially their 35 millimeter lens adapters to put onto video cameras and support all of the things that you would need like follow focus systems and stuff like that. And now, um, while they still make 35 millimeter lens adapters, that's a very small segment of their market. And it's all of this stuff that we're going to talk about today, these rigs, that are really the things that we're going to discuss. Um, as with everything that I do, it's going to be interactive. You guys are welcome to ask questions. If I feel like we're kind of going off topic or we're going in another direction, then uh, I'll just mention that you know, we can talk about that during the break. Uh, we'll go to 6. We'll end promptly just because we have to kind of close up and pack up at 6. But we'll do a break in, in between and, uh, and that's the deal. So let me ask you guys a couple of questions. First of all, who is uh, shooting with DSLR cameras right now, video with DSLR cameras, okay? Who is shooting with uh, traditional video camcorders that have small sensors? And then how about people who are shooting with uh, camcorders that have large sensors? So that's AF100s, that's FS100s, that's F3s, things like that. OK, so it kind of got a mix. And uh, who's not shooting at all, but is just sort of here to evaluate kind of what's going on and things. OK, so everybody's shooting. Yep. OK, cool. Um, so we've got a number of camera systems here. And the reason that we do, this is a 5D Mark III. Uh, this is the FS100 from Sony. I've got a C300 up there on the uh, tripod system. This is the D800, the new uh, camera from, this is really the first camera that Nikon has come out with um, that is sort of a worthy competitor when we talk about using a DSLR camera for video from Nikon. Um, all of the other cameras have sort of had some pluses, but there's been too many minuses, there's too, ma too many you know, sort of like Xs uh, compared to check marks. And so this D800 is really the first camera they've come out with where you could say, this would really be a camera system that I should put into the mix if I want to shoot with this form factor with a large sensor camera. Um, as David was mentioning earlier on, it's pretty much impossible to get this camera. Um, I did a whole thing in Canada recently where we did a whole workflow where we hooked this camera up to an external recorder and we did uncompressed recording, which is really the big plus with this camera system. But it has a beautiful image, you know, um, if you shoot Nikon and you want to continue to shoot with Nikon and you're a still shooter and you're thinking about starting to shoot video, then um, this is, again, probably the first camera that you can say, well, I could probably go into this as a next Nikon camera and continue to shoot stills, but also get the advantages of what we're used to with the Canon systems as far as video goes. So that's definitely something to, uh, to think about. Um, so the reason I have all these different form factors is because we're going to rig up different camera systems in different ways. I'm really going to start off with a tripod system, which is not a Red Rock micro tripod system. But I do have something on here, which is called a cheese plate. And the cheese plate basically is called a cheese plate because it looks like Swiss cheese. And it has all of these different mounting points on it, 3 8 and quarter 20s. And there's a little rod support system on here. And this is something that I always bring with me in my bag because it gives me the option to basically take a camera system that's uh, using this plate here. This is called a DSLR base plate that attaches to your camera. And what I can do is, and I'll show this to you in a little while, is we can put the camera on here. It can sit on these rods, and I'll talk to you about that. And then I can move that off and then just move it onto a different rig. So you can go from sort of a tripod to a handheld rig very, very easily without necessarily taking all the parts off of your tripod when you're using the system. Um, yes? So the, the, um, the cheese plate and the base plate are considered two different objects? Yes, the cheese plate and the base plate are two different objects. I'll actually break that down for you guys. What I think we're going to do first is I'm going to um, show you guys some footage. We're going to take a look at some stuff that's been shot. We're going to talk about some different shooting styles and different shooting techniques. 
because that's really what this couple of hours is about. It's how do you take these camera systems with different form factors, put them into rigs, handheld, shoulder-mounted rigs, uh, rigs that can move from you know to a tripod to other stuff, and how do you shoot more cinematic with them? How are you using these? This is not just supposed to be, I'm cool because I've got this big cage kind of thing and it looks awesome and I've made my little camera look like a big camera. There's a reason that we build out into these rigs. Yeah, yeah, it's a weapon. Yeah, exactly. Um, so all of these different parts that are here, they all have a job. And they're not jobs that are appropriate for every single shooter. You know, it doesn't mean because this is a great shoulder-mounted rig that I shoot that style all of the time. But if I am in a situation where I've got one or two camera operators as a producer, and I have a project where we're going to be shooting for hours on end, and the type of stuff that we need to shoot needs to be stable, and we're shooting with, you know, a lot of different types of camera systems, then putting that camera on your shoulder is going to create a tremendous amount of stability and give you a lot of options in terms of how you shoot. Um, handheld rigs, you know, little rigs like this, these little handheld rigs are fantastic, but again, they're not for every type of shooting style. You know, you might have a little, you know, little rig here and you're shooting and it just may be the right kind of rig for your shooting style and what you're doing. You're doing low angle shots and you're kind of moving around, but this kind of rig, is not the kind of rig that you would shoot with um, for long periods of time. Does that make sense? Even with a small camera system, you know, you wouldn't be sitting here with a rig like this and saying, okay, I'm going to shoot for hours upon hours upon hours on end, because it's just not designed for that type of system. So, um, so we'll take a look at all of this stuff and we'll kind of break it up and break it down and see what kind of configurations we have. And then I can flip this back into, you know, sort of in front of the follow focus system. And that's another thing that I'm going to talk to you guys about is what a follow focus system is and when you may need one and a lot of the times when you don't. So, you know, there's this sort of feeling if uh, you see this follow focus system on a camera system that that's something you have to have. And it has a, a real application and for certain types of shooting it's very, very applicable. But for a lot of you guys, a follow focus system is not the solution. Um, it's just not you know, something that you need in all types of shooting. What, what kind of stuff, uh, who's shooting narrative stuff, like scripted stuff? That could be commercial, that could be short film, that could be things like that. Okay, who's shooting more documentary style interviews and things like that? And a combination of both? Okay, so we've got some people, okay, good. So that's sort of also somewhat of a distinction, you know, uh, and depending on what kind of, let's say, documentary style you're shooting. If you're shooting primarily interviews, then you may not need a follow focus system. If you're doing a lot of run and gun stuff, depending on how you set up your camera and how you're shooting, you may or may not need a follow focus system. But um, we'll set up a follow focus system and we'll talk about why we would use it and really its core application when it comes to commercial and narrative scripted stuff and what that is, okay? When you're shoulder mounted, when you have a rig that's sitting on your shoulder, you know, you are somewhat preventing yourself from getting certain shots. Yes, you can go like this, but you have this rigid piece that's right here, which gives you stability, but it doesn't give you the same kind of mobility that you get when you're in a little handheld rig you know, where you can basically allow your hands and your arms to do the movement when you're moving around. So it really depends, again, on the type of shooting, but then when you, you know, you're planning ahead and you're doing something where you're really trying to have that ability to sort of, you know, um, have a lot of options, then having something that's a, a smaller, I'm going to build something called the event rig, um, and a rig like that is something that can give you a lot of different options in a, in a very small, compact package. And again, for me, a lot of the time I'm traveling, you know, having something that's small and compact also has a huge advantage. So, yeah, go ahead. Now, what camera was this used? Uh, how many frames per second were you shooting? 5D. 5D Mark II at 24 frames per second, yeah. yeah. Using camera sound on that one? Sorry? Camera sound? Use camera sound on recording. Oh, always separate, yeah, all separate all recording. All always, always, always. The real problem that you run into, and you know, this is sort of an aside and we don't need to get into this in the big way, but the real problem you run into with DSLR cameras is that the pre-amplifiers inside of the systems aren't fantastic. So there are workarounds. You can go into a juice-linked preamp and then you can actually you know, get a, a good audio recording inside of the camera. 
Uh, but for a lot of people, by the time you do that and you have all of the pieces, it sometimes makes sense to record the audio separately. I know that, Brian, you do record into camera quite a lot. And you do have a system that works. And so you know, it, it really is just understanding the limitations of the camera system. And again, the pre-amplifiers, the things that are boosting the signal inside of the cameras, whether it's a, a D800, it's a 5D Mark II, or 5D Mark III even, um, they're not just not great for that. You know, they weren't built to be audio recorders. They produce really great, pretty pictures, but they're not fantastic in that area. So, um, so yeah, so there you go. This tripod system, this is the uh, Manfrotto 504 HD, and then we're using this basic system as our support system for the camera that we're using. Okay, it's not a lot. Uh, these are all Red Rock parts, and I'll actually pull something off of another rig so you guys can see what else I used. But I'll kind of break this down for you guys, and that's what the rest of this is going to be. I mean, we're going to basically build stuff up and break it down, and you guys can see how it works. So the parts that we have here, let me get a screwdriver, because that's what it's going to be like here. It's going to be a lot of taking apart, putting together, and then once we build a rig after the tripod system, I'm going to give it to Giuseppe and we'll pump it into the monitors and we can talk about how to shoot and all that kind of stuff. So basically, I'm just going to show you what this is. Because this is the building blocks to any basic support system. Um, it doesn't always have a cheese plate. Okay, but we're using the cheese plate here because there's a lot of places that we can, you know, just take a little arm or we can, you know, mount a monitor or something like that. But the reason that we're using a cheese plate here is so we can put this piece here, which is what's holding the rods, right? So we've got 15 millimeter rods here. Okay. This is, go ahead. Andrew. Yeah. And then we basically just put those in here, and these can be of different lengths. They can be 6 inches, they can be 9 inches, they can be 12, they can be 18. You know, you, you get the size rods you need based on how much equipment you're putting on there, what pieces you're putting onto this system. And then you build this thing out. The first part that you have to basically think about is actually putting some sort of base plate on here, right? So we're going to attach the base plate that comes with this tripod system onto this cheese plate here. And we basically just pop that on here, and we attach it, and then we, we do our business. That's it. You know, that's attached. Now, depending on where you want your support to be, sometimes you may want to attach it so that your rod support is right here in the front because you want to take your rods and you want to actually have those extend beyond there. Sometimes you might take that plate and you might spin it around and you might do the exact opposite. You know, you have to kind of figure out how you want to build this thing, what's going to support and what you are supporting with your kit. There's no really right or wrong way. The only thing that's the wrong way is not securing things tightly enough, you know, and not having as much surface area as you can. So we want to have a lot of surface area. You know, that's really important. So if I've got a base plate and I'm attaching it to a cheese plate, I hopefully will have a base plate that's taking up a lot of that surface area there because that's a more stable system when we're doing that, okay? And then basically what I'm going to do is then take that and I'm going to attach that to this system here and now I have a place where I can mount equipment, right? So we've got these rods here and again these are standard so these happen to be Red Rock Micro. People will mix and match parts from different systems. If you've got something from an older system and then you like a Red Rock part, you can buy that and say, oh, I really like this DSLR base plate. This is a piece that I really like because it allows me to quickly just attach my camera. And then I can take this and just pop that onto the rods and then tighten that down. Right? So that's basically attaching that to the rods. Okay. Now, depending on how long your lens is and what you have attached to here, that's where we start to think about other pieces of equipment that we can attach to the rods. And that also is helping you make decisions in terms of how long or how short the rods are going to be. This is a lens support. For a 24-105 to 105 lens, we don't really have to be that concerned about keeping that lens up. But if you guys had a 70 to 200 f2.8 lens, which is a monster, you know, um, then you really want to go ahead and put something like this on there. And just so you get the idea of the way it works, you essentially hook this up, you have a support here, and then you tighten that down. And that's what's helping support that lens so that you're not introducing additional shake. 
into what you're doing with your camera system. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's a lens support. Um, important if you are using a lot of different types of lenses. Also, even longer lenses that are not that heavy sometimes can benefit from using a lens support system. So for instance, in that Cornerstone video, we were not using the 70 to 200 um, 2.8. We're using the f4, which is great for interviews. It holds focus. It's a really lightweight lens. You can hand hold it. But you've got a lens that's coming all the way out to here. We obviously had longer rods on here than we have right now. And we basically hooked up that lens support to hold that lens up because we didn't want it to shake. You know, when you're moving this tripod, any type of vibration, anything that can be introduced is creating shaky footage. And you notice shaky footage a lot more when you're on the longer end of a lens. So if you're shooting at 21 millimeters, you're shooting at 35, even at 50, you're less, it's less noticeable. But as soon as you start to go into 100 millimeters, 150, 200 millimeter focal lengths, you really start to pick up that movement. You know, it's a reason, one of the reasons why when people shoot Steadicam stuff, they shoot with wider lenses. It's not the only reason, but it definitely helps minimize that kind of shake. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about balancing a tripod system, because it's, it's something that a lot of people don't do. It's something that if you do do it, you basically have to do it every single time and every configuration that you have on the camera. So the, the deal is this. What you're trying to do is you're trying to make it so that when you use your tripod system and you move around, that when you let go, you don't get a kickback. You don't see that little movement that happens inside of the camera system. And that's why you need to balance your tripod. And you need to do it consistently. So if you change out a lens, somebody's got to balance out the camera system if, you, if you're doing a lot of tripod stuff and you're doing a lot of movement. So the basic rule is this. Um, anytime you have a camera, and sometimes it's easier and sometimes it's harder depending on the tripod system you have, but basically you're going to have some sort of center of gravity that is going to exist on your camera system. You can sort of get a sense of where it is just by holding it and getting a kind of idea. But basically what you do, and I'm just going to go through this with you guys quickly. Let me get rid of this cable here, is you get this onto the system and tighten it down. And you usually try to place it about where you think that center of gravity is going to be. And the trick here is that we're taking out any of the counterbalance. So you got to make sure this thing is tightened down and you're spotting it. But what we're doing is we're taking away any of the counterbalance. There are springs inside a tripod head. And those springs are now deactivated. So if I let go of this, it's just going to flop. Make sense? Cheaper tripods, cheaper heads, don't generally have true spring and what we'll talk about next, which is the fluid system. But basically, what we're trying to do initially is we're trying to get it so that without anything, we're sort of getting this sort of steady, right? So we're, we don't want it to instantly tip over just because it's front heavy or it's back heavy. So we're trying to get it to be about there. There'll be minor adjustments that we have to make. And then what we do is we engage the counterbalance. And this one has a three-step counterbalance. So it's now engaged the first spring. And you'll see that that spring is, is activated. And it's creating a little bit of resistance. But it's not actually handling our problem. So because of the height of the camera, because of whatever the weight is, whatever I have here, I'm now going to engage the second one. And basically what we want to do is we want to get it to the point where it doesn't matter where you position it. So it's coming back just a little bit. So I'm going to move it forward just a little. I'm not going to do this perfectly for you guys, but you're going to get the basic idea. So the idea is that you can move it into any position with the counterbalance, and it's not going to move when it's in that position. Does that make sense? And that's the first step to balancing your tripod. Once it's actually balanced, then what you do is you take your drag or your resistance, and you dial that in for your pan and your tilt. Okay, So that's really a personal preference, and that has to do with shooting style. The higher the number, the more resistance you're going to get. But the goal is that when you let go and you roll off of the handle, that you're not going to get that kickback. That's why you balance your camera system. Now, of course, as soon as I take this off of here, as soon as I move this off of here, then I'm going to have to basically make sure. Now, what people will do is they'll actually mark this. And there's actually a new uh, head called the 509 that Monfrotto has. And it actually has memory based on your camera. So you can actually balance it. And then it's got some cool stuff like that. But that's a, that's a key thing in terms of camera movement. Because even though we're going to talk about rigs, 
If you can't balance your camera on a tripod system and shoot well with a tripod, in the end, a tremendous amount of what you do shooting-wise is going to be done on a tripod system. So a good tripod system is important, and being able to balance it is very, very important. And that makes a difference, because when you're doing things like those little snap zooms in that little video that I showed you, you need to be able to move this comfortably, and you need to, you know, need to have stability on there. And then when you let go, you need to make sure that that tripod and that head is going to stay where it's supposed to be. There's another reason why we have you know, rubber and spikes on the bottom of tripods, because if I'm on carpet, I'm going to activate the spikes. If I'm on a solid ground and I, I'm on a wood floor or something, then I'm going to use the rubber. Each is going to give you different stability. This happens to be, these are sticks that basically can go very low and they can go very high, but there's, uh-oh, there he is. What are you doing here? OK, oh, hi, Roth. Um, we have no spreader here. So a spreader, you'll actually see sometimes a floor spreader, or you'll see something called a mid-level spreader. If you're shooting outdoors a lot, and you want to have a spreader, which creates a more stable tripod, because this is the tripod, this is the head, the two things together are a tripod system, then you would get a mid-level spreader. If you're shooting in a studio environment, and you've got a flat surface, you know, then you would actually usually use a floor spreader. But for most people who are in varied shooting conditions, they'll either get sticks like this that have no spreader at all, because you can take one foot and you can basically disengage it, and you can shoot. Yeah, let's get that. And then you can shoot in sort of uneven situations. You know, you're up on a, on a rock and you're in Oregon or something. I don't know why I said Oregon, but you're there. Um, but then if you don't want that and you want a little bit more stability and you're not shooting in those types of conditions, then a mid-level spreader is generally better for people. OK? Any questions on this stuff that you guys have at all? Nothing? You good? OK, cool. All right, so that's how you do that. So to just sort of go to the next stage, what we're going to do is we're going to build out this camera first, which is the FS100. Um, I think that this camera is you know, it's a, an interesting camera. Ergonomically, it's a little funky in terms of the screen, and you've really got to have a separate electronic viewfinder or something if you're going to rig this up on a shoulder-mounted or a handheld rig. But we're going to talk about building this out uh, in a more sort of studio-based configuration. Okay, so this is, you know, if you're inside and you're shooting, um, you know, on a sound stage or something like that, and we'll talk about building out a rig that would be a little bit more um, of that type, and then we'll go from there and see what that's like. So this is a different type of plate situ uh, solution from Red Rock. And you'll see here that we do have 3 8 and we have quarter 20 to actually attach a base plate to here. So that's no different than the cheese plate situation. We have longer rods here, and built into this solution is its own base plate. Okay, so. What we're doing here is we're not kind of doing the DSLR base plate. We're saying, let's put a camera system on this first. We'll attach this to this system, because now we can put a map box on here. We can put a follow focus system and those types of things. And then what we'll do is we'll attach the base plate, and then we'll put this onto the tripod system. So this is a more studio slash cinema based kind of configuration. And that's what we'll build out. Okay? And then if you guys have questions while I'm attaching things, then you can ask them, because that's totally cool. Any questions so far that you guys have? Come on, don't be quiet. The cheese plate double in what? Sure. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, you can set up. Yeah, so it's it's asking whether or not you can use a cheese plate. You're taking talking about with a system like this. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, a cheese plate is just uh, uh, it's just basically very similar to the plate that we see on here. This just happens to be a more solid plate. So I have I still have three eighths, two three eighths holes in here. I have a quarter twenty. The difference between this and the cheese plate is on the cheese plate. It's all right. I like to I like to live on the edge. On the cheese plate, we have tons of 3 8 and quarter 20s. So it's a little bit more versatile. But when we're talking about buying something that has a specific application, and in this case, this particular rig from Red Rock has a specific application. 
this application is to build out a studio style rig. So we're taking a camera system and we're putting it onto a tripod and then we're basically taking that camera and attaching it to this this rig and then this rig is going to do the job of allowing us to have a map box system and a follow focus system and things like that. So there's really not a lot of difference between the two. It's just this has a very specific application. You can buy it. Um, I mean, I should show you guys this. This is kind of the thing to remember. And you can look on the side screens if you want as well. Um, here. This stuff is like erector set stuff. You know, there's no right way or wrong way to build this. There's just a million gazillion configurations of this. And you can buy a very specific rig for a very specific purpose from Red Rock. But if you go into their website and you actually take a look at the things that they have, you'll see that you can go in here and they have different bundles here. So I'll just kind of link on this here. You can buy a studio bundle for a specific camera system. So this is for the FS100, and we're talking about a studio bundle that has that specific purpose. Or, as you'll see, we can go in in a couple of minutes and we can actually build out a rig, and then you can buy additional parts or you can get different parts, and you can kind of build that out and make it work with different camera systems. A lot of these parts that we're looking at on the site, they're parts that can actually be used for more than one camera system, right? Um, a lot of the parts that you're going to take a look at in these different rigs, like for instance, this particular one here, this is called the Nikon Gold Series, where Red Rock built a lot of their most popular rigs specifically for the D800 camera. There's really no difference between this rig right here and the rig that you guys are seeing right here in the middle. This is called the Captain Stubling. This is basically uh, a guy named Stu Mashwitz, and he shoots a certain way with DSLR cameras, and they built a rig kind of after the way he shoots. They've taken that rig now, and they've essentially created a handheld version of that exact rig. And that exact rig is basically, we've got to flip where these handles are and stuff, but that exact rig is essentially the rig that you're seeing right there in the middle. It's just got some gold color on it so that you feel all Nikon-ish <laughs> when you're shooting with it. But it's, you know, it works. We like branding, it works. Um, so this is, you know, this is a studio bundle that's going to be specific to this particular camera system. And what I'm basically doing right now is the first part of that, which is taking this plate that they provide with this system and basically sliding that in and then tying that into this particular system, right? So now I have the beginnings of a rig that has a rod support system. I can put a follow focus system on here. We can put a map box system on. We'll put a map box system on in a second just to take a look at that. And that's kind of the whole idea. And what we're doing right now is we're trying to build this system out so that we can really use it in a real production environment. You know, um, there's certain things that people require when they're shooting in certain types of situations. Um, I'll just throw this on here for now just because of time, but generally if you have the choice and you're mounting a, um, a base plate system and you have the choice between 3 8 and quarter 20, you go with 3 8 all the time because it's definitely a better connector, it's heavier duty, you know, it's a bigger screw. So there you go, I won't go there. So there you go. Um, there's your basic system. So you've got your rod support here. You can build that out. I'll lock this down and then just show you guys what we can do when it comes to a map box system. So this is Red Rock's map box system. And that just attaches on here. And again, everything is rod support, right? But you can see that you have to think about the way you build your system out and what you're doing with it. Because as soon as we put that on here, depending on the lens you have on the system, we basically have to loosen up these rods here. And we're going to have to move the map box back to the lens itself. Make sense? Because otherwise we're going to be bumping into the map box system. Then we can bring that in there and then we have these things called donuts which are basically here. The whole idea, we've got this little quick release here, this little swing away so you can actually access this. The whole idea is that we don't want light to go into here. That's the, a map box has two purposes. A map box blocks light from coming into 
unwanted light from getting into the lens. And it's also designed to allow you to use filters. Okay? That's really the, the dual purpose of a map box system. So you have this filter tray here, and you can hold 4x4s four four or 4x565 four you know, five, five filters, and those drop in there. But then the other main job here is that we're going to build this out to block light. So the swing away is great because it lets you access your lens and you can get to that. And then the donuts basically, the whole idea is you match up and you obviously don't want it to be on the controls of that. But if you put that donut there and then you close that up and then you actually move that up just a little bit because you can actually pop that in here. You know, we're going to move it back a little bit more and we're going to basically snug it into this area here. Then we're not going to have any light getting in. Make sense? What's the donut made of? Donuts made out of rubber. You know, it's just a, and it just sits there and you just, you know, you basically pop it in there and that's it. And it's just, you know, and then you pull that back and then you're blocking light from getting in there. Make sense? Good. The map box that, you know, Red Rock ships comes with these donuts in varying sizes. So depending, I mean, if you're using some of those older Olympus lenses and things, then it's great to be able to have these smaller openings for those smaller lenses. You think, who, who would ever use that? But there are, you know, especially in the DSLR world, we get into that. And then you've got some pretty big honking, you know, um, you know, lenses out there. So they have larger ones there. But basically, all we're trying to do here is reduce the amount of light that can get into here. And then there's additional tools that we use for that. Uh, basically, we have these side flags here. And these just sit inside of the system. So you basically just unscrew this, which loosens that, pop that in here, and then we have these side flags. Whoops, let me just tighten that down. So you tighten this down, and basically you have these little side flags in there, and those can be adjusted. So you can you know, let in or reduce the amount of light that's in there. And then we also have this top flag here, and then this is commonly referred to as either a French flag or uh, you'll also hear it's called an eyebrow and because it looks like somebody's eyebrow and so that basically just sits there and you know if you're going to make the investment into a map box system then having this makes a difference I mean you know a lot of times we're trying to eliminate that light we want to make sure that the lights coming in but there's light from outside sunlight being the big one uh, reflections coming off of things and that's why you need these flags because they're basically allowing you to see the picture you want we love lens flares but you know we like them to show up as like a surprise every once in a while or add them in post we don't like your image to basically have almost this cloud over it because you're getting that lens flare all the time so um, you know mapbox system is definitely something that depending on what you're doing depending on what the style of shooting that you're doing is it's something that you should consider. It obviously adds um, bulk to your system because you can see just by the size of it. Um, you know, but most of the time when people are shooting in this style, they're not shooting alone. This is not a solo type of production. Yes? So if you were trying to shoot a handheld and you know the angle of the sun was pretty clear, it's got to be something because you can't just, the old days we just used to clamp on a French flag on the top yeah, so what he's saying is that, you know, sometimes when you know you're going to be shooting outside and you're going to be handheld and you're constantly moving your camera around and the sun's going to be hitting that lens and you're going to be seeing lens flares, aren't there better solutions in those types of situations? You're saying, you know, you can have a flex arm with some sort of flag. There are solutions out there like that. Um, some of them are questionable to me because they come right off of the hot shoe or a cold shoe. And those seem like they're going to put a little bit of pressure on there. In the old days, are you talking going back to Kigami days? Yeah. We had a handle up there. And we would just put like a toto clamp yep. and a flex arm. People and still do it. People still put a toto clamp and flex arm. You, if you were shooting in cameras this size, where would you do it? Well, it's hard when you're talking about DSLRs to mount something like that. That's when we start to get into rigs, because when you talk about a small rig like this, and once you put a camera system on here, we have these rods here. And the rods can actually be used, and they can actually be built out. So you can actually have a quarter 20 here. You have a quarter 20 male, a quarter 20 female. Or there are other solutions out there 
where basically you're rigging this out and you have other mounting points. So what you can do is you can create points where you would fly a flag off of there or you'd build something out of there from one of these rigs. What the specific solution is going to be, I don't know. I mean, I've got a whole bunch of stuff like the TOTA flags and things like that. Um, sometimes it's just black wrap, you know, and, and we're just throwing that over there. Yep. Yeah, I mean, when you're shooting with a DSLR camera, I mean, you know, one of the things that is nice about most of the DSLR lenses is they do come with lens hoods. And you can actually buy hoods that are a little bit longer. You have to be careful, though, because if you put the wrong hood on the wrong lens, then you start to get vignetting issues and you start to have problems like that. Um, but, you know, nothing has changed. It's just the form factor that's changed. So you have to be a little bit more inventive if you're not shooting in the more sort of handheld. I mean, obviously, once we start getting into big rigs, you have plenty of places to mount things. You have plenty of places to go. But you're also talking about a larger rig, which is um, ideal for certain types of shooting situations. This rig right here, which is for the C300, we'll take a look at this one and kind of talk about that. Um, so let's kind of break down this studio rig here. And I'll throw this up on the sticks. And once I actually build out the DSLR rig and I start to build out the little handheld rigs, that's when I'll have Giuseppe do some stuff. But again, you know, it's this idea that we can keep a camera system up on sticks. And then when we need to shoot with a rig, we can go ahead and we can take that and we can do low shots and we can shoot in different ways. I'm actually going to build out this particular rig, which is. Um, this is part of the Ultra Cage blue line from Red Rock. This is really a new line of products, um, which really, here, I'm going to go ahead and loosen this and show you guys this. Let's build this thing out. This one's pretty cool. So I like stuff that breaks apart and Boy. goes into, yeah, exactly. So let's talk about how to build this out. So again, same concept. We've got a base plate here, right? So we basically have mounting points here, quarter 20, 3 8 We can actually mount that on there. Um, really, really important to have that on any kind of rig system because when you're building the rig out, you have to put it somewhere. And you don't have a table all the time. We normally have a tripod system. So this cage here is really the beginnings of the blue system. Um, it's really this ultra cage. Because what happened was Canon decided to come out with a camera that had a form factor which was completely unconventional compared to most of the other cameras that were out there. And that's the C300. So let me just pull. Huh? Not the first time they've done No, not the first time. That's what camera companies like to do. So let me go ahead and just pop the base plate off of here. And we'll build this out as sort of the core system. And then I'll show you guys different configurations here. So, and you know, remember that the whole point of this, just like when we talked about building out the studio rig, is this is practical application. These rigs don't exist because they look cool. They might look cool, but they don't exist just because they look cool. They have to be something that's right for you for a particular type of uh, shooting situation. So part of this, I'm going to show you how it actually gets built out. And the rest of it, I'm actually going to build out for you guys. Um, the first thing is that. Canon's camera, the C300, has an unconventional mounting system here. It's a 3 8 and it's a quarter 20, but the spacing in which they created it is unusual. And we have a 3 8 here and a quarter 20 up at the front. They also give you a second piece with the camera where you take this out with small Phillips head screws, and then you can basically reverse that. So you have quarter 20 and you have 3 8 in the front. Does that make sense? But this is not a standard sort of configuration for the spacing between 3 8 and quarter 20. So when you buy this particular cage for the C300, and why are we getting this cage? Well, we're getting this cage for two reasons in its base configuration. The first reason is we're getting mounting points, right? So we're getting places that we can actually fly stuff off of here. We can take an arm, you know, and I can take a little arm like this 
and I can take this arm and I can basically fly this off of here and I can put a little light on here. Or I can take an arm over here and I can put a little monitor or I can put something else. An audio recorder can be off of this, right? So that's, that's giving us all of these mounting points. We obviously have a handle here, which in its base configuration is great for handheld low shots and when we want to you know, point the camera up and do things like that. But the key to this is that we have a standard 15 millimeter rod support system. And that's the thing. This is the, this doesn't matter what company makes anything, this is the key. This is the one part that you know you need to have in order to have a rig of some sort. So we get that from that system. Now what you'll see here is um, on the bottom when we're talking about this plate system what Red Rock has done is they've actually shipped their own standard spaced 3 8 and quarter 20. So when you basically pop this off, you can put their system in here. And the whole point of that, and I don't really need to build it out for you guys to see in here, because it's better for me to show you the actual piece and what it is, is that when you're actually taking this system and you're going to go ahead and mount this, I'm going to just take it off. That's the whole thing we're going to do here a million times anyway. What you want to make sure of is that when you attach your C300 to this rig, that it is actually attached properly. So what you're going to wind up doing is when you put that different plate on the bottom of your camera, you're now going to be able to mount a, a quarter 20 and a 3 8 to the bottom of the camera. So you have two mounting points. And that's really going to hold that in. So what's happening is your screws are going to go in from underneath. They're going to go into that little plate on the bottom of the camera. They're going to hold that camera there so it's really, really stable inside of the system. So they built this to be standard for everything, even though they were targeting that? Well, they built it to be standard for everything, but this particular cage, the one that we're looking at right now, this is a very, very specific cage for the C300. Um, this cage right here is their DSLR cage. So it happens to be on their iSpy shoulder mounted rig, but this cage, the part that my hand is holding, this cage could in essence be sort of swapped out yeah. in a system like this and we could do a base system that just had rods and a place for a base plate and a cage for a DSLR. And that's kind of the whole point is, you know, everybody has a different camera system, everybody has a different configuration, a different application. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out you know, what it is that you're trying to do, what kind of shooting style it is, so that you can actually figure that out. I mean, the great thing about here is that you can actually, you know, this equipment exists at B&H, so you can check it out, you can figure out what the configuration is and what you're trying to do. Okay. So, <clears throat> base system here, and we've pretended that we've put that little base on there, and essentially what we do is we make sure that this is raised up, and you'll see that they've even thought about the hot shoe in there. And then, of course, what we're doing is in the bottom, we're basically securing it from the bottom with that quarter 20 and that 3 8. And then from the top, we're screwing this down here and we're creating a. This goes right into the quarter 20 thread that's in the hot shoe. Yep. Okay, so then you've got that system sitting in there. Now that's locked in. And then we actually have a top rod configuration. So if you want to fly things from above, you can do that. But this is it in its most base configuration. I'm going to take off this little handle here and I'm actually going to move this back just a little because I'm going to put a, another piece on here and then I'm going to have Giuseppe just sort of hold this for you guys. So the other thing that's kind of cool about this is that the C300 has a little hand grip and you can just put this hand grip onto the camera system like this. And this is sort of a, I would say, a base kind of configuration for this system. So let's go back in here, slide that in, right? Tighten this down as far as the handle. And then here, Giuseppe, you can come over here. So you'll see. You can not only do those low shots, but then your hand can go right in there, and now you have a small rod support system, you know, and you can put a follow focus system on there. You can do low shots. You can go ahead and pass that around for a minute so people can see what that feels like. 
Yeah, make sure you hold it with two hands, please. Yeah. No, I mean, it, seriously, monitor. what? Where's the monitor going? The monitor you can, yeah, I mean, the monitor you can fly off of the side. Uh, you're talking about the actual monitor that comes with the system? Um, you, this is really not a configuration that you would actually have the monitor on the camera. What you would do is, is... If you're going to do low shots of the fly, you're going to use the PDF. No. You would generally, if you're going to... Sorry, I'm just going to grab this for a second. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to do a low shot like this, you would go down like that. Um, you could fly a small Marshall monitor off of the side here, which is easy to do. So you can just take one of these little arms here. I have one sitting in my hand and basically put you know you can fly a little rod off of here in the side and you can throw that on there and this actually you can put just a quarter 20 on there and the Marshall monitor would essentially this would basically go on here you know or whatever side you want it to be on same I mean you know same just fly one of these these you know these little they call them micro mounts and you can basically mount them anywhere you want and they have quarter 20 female on the bottom and they have quarter 20 male on the top. So anywhere you have a rod support system, sometimes what I'll do is I'll actually fly a recorder underneath the actual system or I'll have it here on the back or something like that. Um, for this, I would basically, you just hold, the, hold it from the handle here. So we've got this little piece right here and then what I do is I'll pop this little mount off of here and put that in here. Now I've got my quarter 20 mount and then grab the Marshall monitor and that'll basically sit there and it rotates so you can basically put it in any position you want so if you're doing low shots you can basically have that facing up this is the new Marshall this is the one that has a waveform monitor built into it really really lightweight um, what I like about it is that it not only has different battery mounts I don't think that's new to anybody um, but comes standard with in out um, HDMI it has a power tap that's standard now which I'll show you guys when we build out this rig, because I'm going to build this out with the Marshall monitor on it as a shoulder-mounted rig. And you can add additional ports on here. So this happens to be the HDSDI in and out port that you can basically add to it. Yeah, so you can just basically throw these on here, and then you get different connectivity. So if I'm trying to monitor on here, this is especially important for Canon cameras, because, of course, the back LCD goes dead on a 5D Mark II or 5D Mark III once you hook up a separate monitor. But I also want to have this feed a video village, not with HDMI, but I want to go to a standard production monitor, then SDI definitely makes a difference. So I'm going to make this in uh, 5, 6, 7-inch, uh, and 9-inch versions. HDMI and an HDSDI out. Sure, if you have this cold swap in there. Because basically it's feeding a signal, and then you can do that. Can you go HDSDI in, I mean, sorry, HDMI in and then HDSDI out? And the, that's why you have this module, is in order to do that. So it's an in and out uh, type of situation. It's not, one or the other. it's not one or Yeah, I mean, that's why you're doing it, is you're trying to give the ability to get a signal in here and then get that signal out a different way. That's why you're adding the module. Otherwise, the module's not there, and you just have HDMI in and out. So you're saying it's a loop through? It's a loop through. There's built in a loop through that's HDMI. So you always have, a, a, on these new Marshall monitors, you have an HDMI in and an HDMI out. And that's fine for a lot of applications. Uh, but you know, a lot of monitors that people have invested in or that they rent, for instance, Panasonic monitors that have waveforms, the 17-inch ones, they're just sort of standard on almost every set. So we want to feed HDSDI into that so we can actually bring up scopes and we can actually look at you know, RGB parades and we can look at a waveform, we can look at the vector scope. And um, it's nice that we have one in here, but it's relatively small. It's great for the person who, you know, and again, here's the other thing that's great about this. We don't have a follow focus system on here right now, but if you're on something like a C300 and Giuseppe's operating, and then I have a follow focus system on here, I may be the focus puller, and now I have a monitor here, and I have an easy way to monitor that picture. If we're using a DSLR, then it's different. I mean, it's like you said, Brian, you know, we're going to have to have this monitor hooked up here if we want to monitor that. Um, or on a C300, you know. Um, the, the C300 monitor is a pretty cool monitor. It doesn't mean that we can't mount it. It happens to have um, a little bit of length here. So if we didn't want to go into a different monitor system, we just have to understand what the limitation is in terms of the length. So we've got a little bit of length here. As long as we can get that, we can fly it over here, or we can fly it over there, and we can get it up onto something. For instance, in this case, 
the attachment that I have is actually a cold shoe attachment, then I can actually put that right into, it's all just rigging, right? I mean, you know, it's just a million different ways to do this. But basically, if I wanted, the, if I wanted this monitor to be in there, then I put this cold shoe attachment on there. That would pop in there. And then the real key would just be, do I have enough length here on these cables? I'm going to have to move this in a little bit. I'm going to have to do a little jerry-rigging to kind of get it to where I want it to be. Or I'm going to fly it off the other side of the thing. Well, uh, technically, because you have the bottom mount, you could, you could take that off here. You also have quarter 20s here, though. So you could just put a cold shoe or do something like that. And remember, this points everywhere on the cage. The whole point of the ultra cage is you don't necessarily want to take this piece off because this piece is creating an additional point of stability. You could probably take the handle off and still have the screw. Um, I've actually never done it, but you probably could. But you would still be sort of fighting that point of, you know, basically contact. So you'd probably fly it off of a quarter 20 right here or something like that. I mean, you've got them on both sides. They're even on both sides. There's so many different points that you can fly something. And that's really, you know, that's what these little, these little Israeli arms or what Red Rock calls these micro arms are all about. Because this is your ability to basically say, I want to fly something off of here and there's your monitor. You know, or I want to fly something off of here and here's your monitor. Would you operate a handheld like that? Uh, I think it's better if you put the monitor here. Since I would like to have the monitor here, no, no, on the side because on the side you would operate the camera. You're going to do this. Depends on the configuration. I would operate in this configuration if I needed to have a follow focus system. Yes. And also if I wanted to mount a small map box system or something like that. Um, you know, one of the advantages to the C300 in its base configuration is I probably wouldn't do this. You know, for me, the idea would be, you know, to give myself a place where I could actually put a follow focus system on here or something like that. What we should really do is start to build this out, though, in a different configuration that people would really, you know, um, yeah, would sure. use in a, you know, with some more stuff. Yeah, go ahead. Why, why would you want that on your shoulder? Why wouldn't I want that on your shoulder? One of the things I don't understand from the way, I mean, I, I was a special shooter like many years ago. Yeah. With those big tube cameras and whatnot, and I got used to shooting on the shoulder even when I created them like this and went down to that level. I mean, you know, I would, I would, I would raise the viewpoint so I could see it. But the thing is, it seems that a lot of these rigs are for shooting like mid chest. Okay. okay. So, so what, what you're saying? Um, I'm just going to repeat it. Is you know, historically, the way a lot of people shot was shoulder mounted. Even with you know, with 16 millimeter and, and some smaller 35 millimeter cameras. Correct. But there's, you know, there has been, I'm not going to say uh, there's been an evolution of shooting styles. It doesn't mean it's replaced the other shooting styles. But handheld shooting with smaller rigs has become another style of shooting. So I have found that for myself, and actually while that's being passed around, I'll build out a rig to show you guys this. Are there enough parts here? Um, this is one of the most simple rigs that Red Rock makes. I'm going to build out what's called the event rig. And it is a, another handheld rig. It's not a shoulder mounted rig. And essentially what it's got is this crossbar here with handles on it. We just basically have 15 millimeter rods of whatever size you want on here. And then there is essentially a rod receptacle here, which is going to hold uh, basically a brace. Okay, we're going to get a body brace on there to create another point of stability. So right now you can see that the points of stability that I have are two points of stability because I've got my hands on here. I can brace this for handheld shots. And if I want, I can flip these handles up and if I want to shoot in a different way. And once I put a camera system on there, you'll see why you might want to do that. Sometimes when you're doing a low shot, it makes sense to take that handle and to actually take the handle and configure it like this because it's just more comfortable to flip the handle into that position because otherwise your hands are underneath the rig. Um, so let me just go ahead and build out a camera using that so you guys can get a feel for what that is. This is called the event rig. And again, it's just made of lots of red rock parts. You know, it happens to be what they do is they take, you know, five or six of the parts that are part of what they create. And they say, if we put these parts together, this is a configuration that a lot of people like to shoot with. 
So that's what we're going to do. We're going to put together a configuration that we know a lot of people like to shoot with, and that's going to be a particular rig. So this is kind of the event rig. But the other part to this rig here is that third part of contact, which is this, which is essentially a body brace, right? So you can put this on here, and this is now adjustable, and you're creating an additional point of contact. So when you're shooting, as long as you're moving, you've got sort of, it's not a shoulder mounted rig, we're not on our shoulder here, but what you're doing is, you know, the style of shooting with these cameras is a little bit different because we're generally, if we're using a DSLR, we're looking at this monitor. There's no, you can put an electronic viewfinder on these cameras. You, absolutely. And I'm, saying you're, I'm not saying you're going to like it. I'm just saying that this, it's just a totally different style of shooting. So let me just pass this around, make sure this is tight, so you guys can get a feel for that. That's, Well, no, what you're usually doing is you have the camera up to you and you actually have a viewfinder attached to the, the LCD screen. So this becomes a handheld rig. If you're going to go lower, then you need to attach an external monitor like this and you'll actually rig that off of there and that'll be on an angle. Or you get what's called an electronic viewfinder, which is basically a viewfinder that attaches to and comes off of the camera so you can actually put it right up against your eye. I mean, there's a lot of stuff here. This is not a one-size-fits-all world. Yeah, it's a just a totally different shooting. In fact, what we're going to do right now is now that this C300 rig is coming back, I'm going to build out this rig to be a shoulder-mounted rig. We're going to take this base configuration, and we're going to take a look at how we can actually build that out to be something else. So let's pop that onto the, uh, <coughs> onto the back here. Now what we have on the back of this system All right, you guys ready? OK, so what we have on the back of the system is we basically have uh, about you know, a few inches of rod here. And this is part of their iSpy series. So if I take this off, and this is no different really than what we're seeing underneath this DSLR rig here, we basically have a shoulder mounted component here. right? So this is going to sit on your shoulder. This is now going to take this rig and make it a shoulder mounted rig. But how do we make this a shoulder mounted rig that's really usable for the style of shooting that we're going to do, well, what we're going to do is we're going to add uh, what's called an offset. And this offset is basically allowing us to tighten this down and then tighten this over to the rods here. So we've got these small rods on the camera system. And now when I take this off, I actually have Giuseppe take it off, and he can actually put this on his shoulder so you guys can see it. But you'll see that now what we're doing is we're basically bringing that camera system Flip this down here, boom. For a C300, you're now creating a shoulder mounted rig. Now we have the built in hand grip right here. We've got this. Now we have a problem. Giuseppe, lean forward a little bit when you put it on your shoulder. And look at this system right here. The biggest issue that we have at the moment is the balance of this system. So what we have here is basically an offset. We can use batteries. But these happen to be counter, you know, counterweights or counterbalance. And these will basically just sit on the back here. And these are going to create the right kind of balance that you would need. And you move them back and forth depending on the, you know, the front system here. And you'll see that now you get a system where you have a counterbalance. Want to move them back a little? I need more. Huh? You have more? Yeah, no, this is what we got for now for this system, but we can move the camera back. But you got the basic idea. Yeah. And then you see that you basically have a shoulder mounted system here. But the offset not only lets you balance it, but the, what the offset really lets you do is it lets you use the electronic viewfinder in the C300. So if that's the system that you want, then you can use the offset. Now if you don't want to use the offset, then what we can do is we can attach directly to this system here. But when we do that, then we're moving the whole camera system over here. We might even mount the camera right to this. And then we basically are going to put um, you know, a, an external monitor or something like that on there. So if you guys, you know, if anybody, I'm not going to pass this around the room, but if one or two of you want to come up and actually feel what this feels like, you can go ahead and try that. And here's the other thing here, Giuseppe. If you want to come up here, if we take this, we now have handles on here. And we can basically attach this to the front of the rod support system. And you'll see that now we have handles. Okay? So if you're shooting with a wider lens 
um, if you've got a deeper depth of field and you don't have to ha have your hand on the lens all the time, or if you have a follow focus system on here, then you can basically use the follow focus system and then go back here to the hand grips. And you'll see that that's a more traditional sort of electronic news gathering or you know, shoulder mounted type of thing. And why do we shoot with this? This is prolonged shooting. This is shooting for long periods of time. And um, you know, the thing to remember is whether or not, where's that little rig that we had the D800 on? Nobody took that, right? Ross, get back here. No, I'm just kidding. Somebody just went out the back door. What do you think of that? It's all right. Cool. It's kind of cool. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to bring it back. I'm just going to, yeah. So the trick is, this is the trick. The trick to shooting cinema style is not to pretend that you're a tripod. Anytime you have any rig, whether it's handheld or it's shoulder mounted, you're not trying to be perfectly still. There has to be motion in your camera moves, OK? Um, one of the things that I usually tell people is if they're shooting with a little rig like this, and you can actually shoot for long periods of time. If you have a small lens on this thing, I'm not talking a honker like the 70 to 200 28, but if you have a small lens on here, it's like rocking a baby. It's just creating a rhythm. Move the camera. You know, Create a motion that's part of your actual shooting style. And you're going to do a similar type of thing with a shoulder mount. You just have more stability, so you don't necessarily have to do it as much. Your moves can be a little bit more slight. They can be a little more subtle. But you will have to move this. And where you're really going to like be a game over on this is if you're using long lenses and they're not image stabilized. So image stabilized lenses are going to make a big difference when you're shooting, especially with a handheld rig. So for instance, a 24 to 105 on a camera like this or on the can, uh, Nikon, it's a 24 to 120. That's both image stabilized versions of those lenses. That would be a perfect type of lens to use on a rig like this because you're going to get the image stabilization, which is going to be compensating for some of that stuff. You're also being creating a little bit of camera movement. And we'll plug the cameras in. I'll do a, a, a 5D Mark III on that. Actually, let's plug that in and see kind of what that looks like. OK, so now take a look at this. Now, here's where that problem is that we're talking about, where we're talking about having a non-image stabilized lens. This is an 85 millimeter Zeiss. It's a beautiful lens, but we're dealing with a situation where, now look, you can have movement. And there's nothing wrong with movement. And we're used to seeing movement a lot. Um, you know, But it's making sure that the camera is always moving. And so you know, if you're going to do that, we have stability because of the shoulder mounted rig. And it's OK if you get, I mean, this is something from a shooting style we see a lot of now. But it's making sure that it is motivated and it's predictable. You know, it's, it, it's got to be consistent. Whatever that movement it is that you're going to introduce, it can't be a mistake. It's got to be something that you're trying to do so that when you're, you know, when you do this, this is kind of, you know, you think about an episode of The Office or something like that. And you've got a little bit of movement in that camera and you're on the longer end of a lens, um, you know, when you're doing this stuff. Huh? Giving a tell. You're giving a tell. Aren't you? Is that what I guess you could be. You're, telling, you're telling the people at the other end that uh, it's yeah. deliberate? I, yeah. I mean, if it's done all the time, it, you're showing them it's deliberate. But it's uh, more voyeuristic and all that fun stuff. So you'll see that you've got a little bit of that rock there, a little bit of that movement. Of course, you know. then once you're on that longer end of the lens, that's where we start to get into having a follow focus system, right? Because the thing about a, 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 you know, when you're shooting narrative and you're doing stuff, is that you've got to make sure that you're in focus all the time. Well, you can actually use the viewfinder on this, Giuseppe. So you're OK. <laughs> Believe it or not, yeah, we've been shooting with DSLRs for so long. right? So it's just having that movement and keeping that camera moving all the time. Now, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to turn off the camera, and I'm going to throw the 24 to 105 on there. And we'll put the image stabilizer on. And you'll see what the difference is when we're putting that on. So I'm going to turn you off for a second. Are you ready? No, no, none of these cameras have image stabilization. It's in the lens. It's the lens that has the image stabilization when we're talking about these systems. So that's just the Canon system and the way it works. Um, and I can't change that. So we buy lenses that have image stabilization if we need it. What kind of extra batteries use the ISA? Well, the IS is built into the lens itself. I guess it's being you know, juiced by that. I don't know. I don't know how much it. I have no idea. It's a good question. It's a question I don't have an answer to. But thank you. I don't know if I'm going to look at the answer for that one. I might. Um, YouTube has some good stuff showing various ways to look with and without the image. Image stabilization, yeah. 
just just search for it. Because I yep. call it recently. Now you see see what see what's happening. So float across the room a little, Giuseppe, and we've got the image stabilizer on now, and you just sort of get this sort of floaty effect. Um, you know, and as you don't use image stabilization when you're on a tripod system, but it's great when you're on handheld or you're doing a shoulder mount, especially if you're floating that camera around and you're sort of giving that sort of feeling when you're doing stuff. So, um, you know, it can make a big difference. Yeah. Try that and see what it feels like. Yeah, go ahead. Come on up. So, some of you guys, maybe all of you guys, probably at least some of you guys know what a follow fo uh, focus system is. This is a basically an iSpy based rig that has been kitted out so that it has the new Ultra Cage Blue for the DSLR. So this is a rig that is designed not to have the camera in front of you. It's basically to have the camera offset right from where you are. You can grab the follow focus system with your hand and you can monitor picture over here. So that is the basis of this system. Um, so again, it's their basic iSpy system, but this piece right here is the equivalent DSLR version of what we see here with the Ultra Cage Blue here for the C300. So its whole, you know, whole deal here is to set it up so that you can use it for that purpose. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this up and we're going to talk about how it all works. Okay? Um, Giuseppe, you're going to have to drop that rig. Sir, okay. and we are going to work together to get this camera system on here. This team, yeah, right on the floor is fine. We can go on the floor and just turn it off. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So you're going to hold that. You're going to basically. You're going to. You're going to hold this for me under. Okay, I'll do the holding. It's fine. Important. There it is. Quarter twenty thread. That's all you need. Uh, hold on. Yeah, that works. Can I what? Can you answer a question while you're doing that? Absolutely. The mic that I use on the C300 for reference audio, hold on. I have it with me. The Video Mic Pro from, uh, from Rode. Yeah. It's really, right now, there's nothing, there's nothing smaller. No, not yet. I mean, the, the only mic that I would say that's really smaller that you could definitely consider, um, it's not a better mic. The, the Video Mic Pro is a better mic. But the small Sennheiser MKH 400, it's a tiny little, looks like a finger. That's probably the smallest little reference mic that you can put on the C300 that I've found so far. And it's a good mic. It's just a big investment for reference audio. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think that the other one is a little more versatile. OK, so here we are in the cage here. Um, we basically have a, f oh, look at that. It all lines up. And I, that was not even planned, I swear. Um, so in order to use a follow focus system, you either have to have lenses that have gears built into them, because you have gears on the follow focus system, or you have to put a lens gear onto your lens, your existing lens. Um, every manufacturer has a different approach or a different way to create their lens gears. This is Red Rocks. Red Rock makes different lens gears for basically different lens sizes. So I've got a bucket load of them here. And you basically match up the one to the type of lens that you're using so that it fits that. Um, if you build out your own case with your own pick and pluck foam, then you can basically leave these things on your lenses. And they just live on there if you're using a follow focus system. Otherwise, you just take them off and you gear them depending on you know, what you're doing. But basically. It just sits on there. You make an adjustment, and we basically tie that on. Obviously, we want to have full range of motion here. So the idea is to get it into its last position, and then you basically attach that basically close to where it's going to be. So I'm just giving you guys a sense of how we do this. And then we want to be able to rotate that lens all the way without bumping in. So we're going to have to adjust this. It's going to be pretty. 
pretty uh, tight here. We're using a Zeiss ZE here, so the travel path is actually really, really long for this lens. So we have to basically take this little gear system and have it match up pretty much right at the beginning here. You look very suspicious the way you're looking there. <laughs> okay, so then there's your full range of motion, right? So now I can actually move this and rotate this, and it's, I'm going to have to straighten it out a little bit. But the basic idea is that once it's actually set up, I can match these two things up, these two gears, okay? And then Giuseppe's basically going to turn that, and now we're controlling that from that. Well, that does two things right off the bat, right? It's more comfortable for the operator to actually change the focal, I mean, the focus of the lens, but it also gets your hand off of the lens, so it's reducing vibration. Make sense? Okay, so that's a lot. Um, the other thing we can do, and these are made uh, by Red Rock, these are called whips. So if we basically are pulling focus, and Giuseppe is the camera operator, and then we're changing focus over time, well, I need to have a monitor here. That's where that Marshall comes into play. And we can actually add that to the system. But basically, that's where you have a focus puller. And why are we pulling focus? Well, the whole idea of actually making the investment into and having a follow focus system is repeatability. The idea is that we want to change the focus from one thing to another, one object, one person to another person, or a singular person moving through a space and you're shooting more wide open, right? So it's very, very common in feature films for people to shoot with larger sensor cameras, but they actually shoot, in, their aperture's pretty wide open. They might shoot at a 2.8, um, you know, for, for a lot of stuff. Well, you can't keep the focus when shooting at 2.8 when somebody's walking through a space. But if, uh, if somebody is sitting here and they basically mark on here, or actually what's really cool about the version three follow focus from um, from Red Rock. Let's let's put it down and then I'll do it. But basically, yeah, let me put it down. Let's put it on the table here so people can see this. And let's turn it around the other way. So actually, you know what? Let's keep this here. You watch that, and then I'm gonna just take a follow focus system and show it to you guys, and then I'll pass it around. By the way, they have other, this is a studio configuration of the same follow focus system, so that if you have this set up, for instance, that FS100 system, then you can basically have the follow focus on both sides, so that if the camera operator's over here, and you want somebody to be pulling focus from this side, you don't necessarily have to have that whip. They can actually grab this actual unit right here, okay? But what you're looking for on your follow focus, this is a basic follow focus system. And so in a basic follow focus system, what you have is you have a place where you have you know, this removable disc that you use, a dry erase marker, basically. And you mark, OK, here's the first position of the person and where they are in the room. OK, and then you go to another position. You mark another position and another position. And then basically focus pulling is basically going from one point to another, from A to B, essentially, or A to B to C. Right, so you have to you, you block an actor. And then basically, this is the focus pull. OK, so that's why you need this. It's repeatability. It's repeatability of focus. That's why a follow focus system exists. You're following the focus of something. Now, the upgrade to that is the version 3 version. And what that has is it actually has what we call hard stops in here. So what you do is you set up your, your start point for where you're going to actually use this. And then what we do is we take these other stops here. And I'll just pull them out here. Hold on. And you basically say, OK, so my pull is going to be from, from here to here. But now you have stops. So there's a place. So when the person's actually pulling, they're not just looking. I mean, for safety, you could actually mark the ring. But you basically have a stop here. So there's actually a place for them to actually stop between two points. 
But that's essentially what you're doing when you're following focus. It's a practicing or rehearsing of somebody is going from one position to another. Or if you're doing a rack focus, you're sitting here, and I want to rack to Brian over there. So basically, we set up the camera, and we basically mark from you, you're in focus. Then I move this, and I say, OK, you're in focus. And then it's a move, boom, boom. Now, what's great about these hard stops is I could move that to that second position, and your rack focus would be boom. You know, boom, and that would be your rack. And then, depending on how fast or how slow you wanted it to be, you would have those hard stops. Right. What do you want to say? Boom. boom. You actually make the sound effect boom, boom. as well <laughs> when you're doing that. Um, does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So, yeah, go. Some people like the hard stops. It, you know. Yeah. It's to each their own. I mean, this is a great, this is a great rack focus tool, of course. And if you have actors who know how to hit their marks and they're doing it consistently, then it's great. Um, it's another tool that's on here. What's great about this? I mean, it's no different than any other follow focus system. You still got a ring. You still turn it. If you don't want to use those hard stops, you don't have to use them. They're there if you want them. I mean, you pay for them if you if you're going to use them. You know, it's not like oh, we're going to throw those in for you. But they are there, and for certain types of shooting situations or certain people, there are also very experienced ACs, you know, camera assistants, who have been pulling focus for years and years. And, and they'll look at that and they'll say, that's not the tool I want. Red Rock's not the first company to put hard stops into their follow focus system, um, but it's a very cost effective solution for having hard stops in there. Yeah? What about, uh, I, I understand the value of having, you know, the vans that fit around, depending upon what it's moving in, like the lens. But wouldn't it um, be more versatile if you just had like, um, you know, like a rubber band or a belt kind of system, which would pretty much groove into any kind of lens? So the question is, wouldn't it be better if you had a rubber band or a belt kind of system that could groove into any kind of lens? There are, as I said before, a gazillion solutions for gearing lenses. And some of them are the approach of what you're talking about. Um, each company has designed a system to go with their components that are based on a standard. This is a point. No, I know. This is a standard 0.8 pitch, so you're going to see that in all of pretty much the follow focus system. There are different pitches, but your standard is, you know, is basically that. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, there's, uh, if you're an independent person and you're just shooting by yourself, then sometimes you don't need this. You know, like I said, a follow focus system has specific applications. And there are solutions that are on the market that are just sort of like something that goes onto the, onto the lens and just let you, lets you pull a handle. Or you know, some people take, though they don't work well, I'll tell you from experience, you know those, those can opener things? They look like a big rubber thing, and you tighten it on the can to get the can open. So you can use that as sort of a, 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 you know, it's like a, a homemade kind of follow focus system. But it gets it stretches over time and it gets kind of you know wobbly and things, um, but there are a lot of solutions out there. Yeah, a lot of people you know would just mark their lenses and do that kind of stuff. All right, so this is an Anton Bauer battery. It's not uh, we're not reinventing the wheel by having an Anton Bauer battery on here. But this is a, a back plate here that basically is a powered solution that is going into this I spy system that Red Rock has created. And it's a two parter here because what's great about it is that whoops, I'm going into the wrong side here, is that it will power our monitor, but they also have set it up for this DSLR rig where it's going to power the camera. So we're getting a big, we're getting our counterbalance here. There's access directly underneath here. I'm not going to set it up right now, but you guys basically, the, the door opens. This goes up in here. So now we're powering both our camera and our monitor off of the monster counterbalance here. And this is going to allow you to shoot for long periods of time um, You know, using this. Let me take the whip out. Go ahead. And so this is a very similar type of setup to what we had. And the counterbalance is right for the oh, DSLR yes. there. Okay. And you'll see here that we've got the monitor there. You know, we've got the follow focus system if you want to grab that. And obviously, depending on your lens and your position, you'll have to decide on the length of your rods, where that's going to be. If I have a longer lens, the follow focus system is going to get moved up here, right? So then I have to figure out where is my camera 
we actually don't care where the camera is right now. What we care about is where the follow focus system is. Does that make sense? Because we're monitoring picture from here, right? Once we've set exposure, once we have you know, our core things in place, our shutter speed, we have our aperture locked in and things like that, we really care about focusing and we care about monitoring picture. So in this kind of configuration, if I need to, I can basically make adjustments to either making the, the rods longer and actually making adjustments that way, or I can even move the camera back by making adjustments here. Okay, but we may need a longer uh, you know, rod system for that kind of stuff. So if you guys want to try this and see how it feels on the DSLR type configuration, yeah, feel free. Push the monitor more closer to the lens Are you getting possible. a picture? Oh, let's okay. get a picture. Wait, let's get a, let's get a, uh, let's actually get a picture on there. Yeah. All right, guys. So basically, I'm going to make this sort of, uh, you can try out the rig time. And we're going to start to break down the room a little bit. Hopefully, you guys learned some stuff. And thank you for coming. Yeah. For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web. 